let us uh let us get going um good evening um this is the good lord what month is it august meeting of the advisory panel on racial disparities in the criminal and juvenile justice system um hi nice to see everybody let us do our usual introductions i'll go through the hollywood squares as they appear on my screen and if you would briefly introduce yourself um that would be great um aaron let us start with you hi everybody aaron jacobson from the community justice unit of the attorney general's office i use she her pronouns great judge davenport Hi. Hi, everyone. Amy Davenport. I'm a retired uh, judge and currently and have been a member of the Council for Equitable Youth Justice for since since I retired in 2015. Thank you. Dan Bennett. Hi, Dan Bennett with the Vermont State Police and have been for the last 12 and a half years. He will also be as long as far as uh, Good Lord, I can't speak. He will also be replacing Captain Barb Kessler um, at this point as she's retiring in November. And he will be DPS's representative to, to the panel. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner, um, ODG rep on this panel. Good to see everyone. Jessica. Hi, everyone. Good evening. My name is Jessica Brown. I use she, her pronouns. I am an assistant professor and the director of the Center for Justice Reform at Vermont Law and Graduate School. Great. Thank you. Jen Furpo. Sorry, I'm doing this from my cell phone, which is a first. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it may end in disaster, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Jen Furpo, uh, Vermont Police Academy. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Laura, that we will have a longer introduction for you shortly. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Carter. I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the new data analysts in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics in the Office of Racial Equity. So thanks for having me join you. And thank God you're here. <laughs> Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth Morris, uh, Juvenile Justice Coordinator at DCF, although not the uh, voting designee. That is my supervisor, Tyler Allen. Um, and back from maternity leave, it's all good, good to see all of your faces. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Susanna. Hi, good evening. Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Thank you. Chris Loris. Yeah, Christopher Loris. I'm a research associate with Crime Research Group. Full disclosure, I'm also an appointee to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, but I'm not here uh, wearing that hat today. Representative Arsenault. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Angela Arsenault, uh, state rep from Williston, and I serve on House Judiciary. Thank you for coming. Ward Goodenough. Hi, Ward Goodenough. I'm the Windsor County State's Attorney. Um, I'm also on the Executive Committee for the State's Attorneys and, uh, Association. Thank you. Farzana. Hi, my name is Farzana Leva. I'm the Orleans County State's Attorney, and I'm also part of the Executive Committee. Nice to meet everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Alona. Hi, I'm Alana Tate, the Compliance Monitor with DCF, um, and I sit on the Adolescent Services Unit team with Elizabeth and Tyler. Um, Derek. Derek. Derek, can you not hear me? This is really weird. Derek, I think you've frozen which is a strange thing to say in August. We'll come back. Judge Morrissey. 
I, I don't know if Derek was having this. I was having issues hearing you too. I logged out and logged back and I'm still having issues. So I'm not sure if there's a, a issue with the, I don't know what's going on, but I was able to, um, I was able to get connected. Um, but anyway, my name is Mary Morrissey. I am a Superior Court judge and I am the judiciary's um, representative on this committee. Great. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler Allen. I'm the, um, uh, at present, I am the commissioner designated appointee from DCF on this group, uh, and I am the adolescent services director with the family services division. Great. Thank you. Jennifer Pullman. Hi, I'm late. Some of us uh, got on to the Teams uh, link, which I can't figure out either why it always goes to Teams and when you set up a Zoom. But I'm Jen Pullman. I'm the ED for the Center for Crime Victim Services. I am not uh, a voting member, but Aton lets me hang out. So thank you. And you contribute enormously. Thank you. Derek. Derek, can you hear me? I can, yeah. I had to switch to a different laptop with um, hopefully better internet than my work one. So apologies on the tech side. Derek sure. Mio Dovnik. Uh, I'm with uh, Vermont Department of Corrections. Uh, nice to see folks. Okay. Rant. Hello. Grant Taylor here taking minutes for the group. Great, thank you. Matthew Bernstein. Hello, um, Matthew Bernstein, child youth and family advocate for the state of Vermont. And I'm here um, as a uh, community member, not an official panel, member of this um, panel. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Reverend Hughes. Good evening, everyone. This is Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director for my Racial Justice Alliance. Um, I'm also a um, commander of the Veterans of Foreign Wars here, at Post 782 in Burlington. And um, I serve as a minister at a church here in Burlington as well. Uh, some of the work that we've done actually um, started this group back in 2017 uh, as Justice for All. The only original member here, it looks like, is is um, Rebecca Turner. So I just wanted to give a special shout out uh, to you. Uh, and yeah, I originally came, I was gonna come and offer some some other stuff tonight, but I thought it'd be good to step back and let you get your work done and, and we can come back to um, what I was gonna present um, in September, uh, if that's if that works for you, Aton. Um, let's get to that in a moment, sure. Um, let me finish with this, uh, McKinsey. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a law clerk for Rebecca Turner in the Office of Defender General. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and Catherine Walsh. I am a community member. I live in Winooski, and I'm trying to be supportive of good change. Thank you Great. for letting me be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, announcements. There's rather a list this evening. Um, absent tonight, uh, Chief Stevens, Witchy, and Sheila. Um, this is going to affect our agenda to some degree because Witchy let the, how to put it, the lift for the community safety subcommittee to Sheila, apparently not knowing that Sheila wasn't going to be here this evening. So that's kind of just not happening. That's off the agenda. So um, this may end up being a fairly short meeting. Mark, that's what sort of feeds into what you just emailed me. Um, September's looking to be a lot more full. So tonight would be great, but if you're not ready, I'll make it work. Well, I'm, I mean, it's uh, let's go for it. I'm, I'm as usual. I'll need to hop off and get out of here, um, uh, right before seven, so I can get somewhere else. Um, but um, yeah, I'm glad to do it. Happy to do it. As far as um, and I'm trying to figure out how to get my camera on here. Uh, if you just bear with me, I totally um, bear with you. Yes, Tim, you have a question. 
Oh, um, yeah, I'm uh, Tim, uh, for folks that don't know me from the Department of State's Attorneys and, and Sheriffs. And um, I just wanted to say, uh, War yeah, Ward and Farzana are on the executive committee. If you have questions about how the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs uh, operates, um, this is a good uh, representation. This is the executive committee that I'm often saying, oh, I'm going to go chat with the executive committee. Um, so I'm happy that they're, they're on um, and just wanted to make sure we are often talking about criminal and ju juvenile justice system that um, they had a chance to um, listen in here tonight. And, um, you know, Farzana is new to the executive committee. Ward's been on for a little while, but I just wanted to welcome folks uh, in that in that setting. And um, and thank you. OK. Um, I am given that Mark has to go relatively early, given that it's 612. Um, I'm going to hold off everything until we hear from him and he can then go and we can do house cleaning and housekeeping, um, after he's gone to his next commitment. Are there any objections to that? Okay. Um, yeah. I, um, I just wanted to, um, also leave time for the DRJS to quickly present uh, on some stuff we've got for you. Got it. Um, can we let Mark go first and then we'll get to that? Yeah. Okay, great. Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eitan. And, um, and also, um, happy summer to everybody that's on. <laughs> it's uh, going pretty quickly. Uh, I want to just alert you to... Um, the, I think the um, informational nature of what it is that I'm sharing is uh, uh, whoever is administering could provide me uh, the ability to share a few slides. That'd be great. Uh, but it's strictly informational. Um, I've had some conversations, uh, had some conversations uh, with representatives from almost every group that is uh, represented here. It's kind of hard to uh, remember. Uh, who's on this thing anymore now? Because I think that we've been we've added probably about three or four seats uh, since we've stood this thing up. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to take a, a few minutes and and just give you something informational. Uh, some of the work that that we've been doing has um, led us to um, what we refer to as is community engagement and support work, which is a fancy way of saying uh, something that's really a little bit more direct service oriented. Uh, and that's been, um, as of late, uh, probably over the last couple of years, it's kind of hard to see the uh, pandemic lay bare, uh, what it has without understanding that people need help. Um, systemic change is great, uh, but people need help. So I'm not going to um, blow this presentation up completely like in presentation mode, only because um, I've got a problem on my end and it, I will change the slides and it will not advance. So I'm going to keep it uh, the way it is right now. And if folks are having problems seeing it, I'm just going to blow it up a little bit. Just please let me know and we can figure something out. But um, I'm going to just take your silence as uh, the fact that you can see the slide deck that I'm sharing. Looks good to me. <clears throat> and what I'll do is, is I'll, I'm just going to tear through some slides really quickly because I, I really need to get down to the bottom of this deck to get to the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so moving through the, the mission, our mission hasn't changed in a while in the work that we're doing. And while I'm trying to get to where I'm going, I wanted to just um, remind you of the different ways uh, that we're doing the work that's data driven. Uh, so there's a lot of data that's out there on the site and we're actually in the middle of a a revision and an update to the site on the data cards and the data um, maps and so forth that are out there. But community engagement and support is is really at the heart of the con this conversation. Uh, all of this other stuff is important. I'll just throw a shameless commercial in for August 26th. I'll drop a link in for First African Landing Day, which will be at the Intervale. That's our flagship, our fifth anniversary um, cultural empowerment event. Um, uh, so we've we've been doing a number of things with um, community engagement and support, but just what we're 
working towards this is just trying to figure out ways that we can help folks and we're doing it in the smallest of ways in some areas and in larger ways and others. Um, there is a convergence though of what we're, we're um, experiencing uh, that I'm most concerned about, that most are most concerned about as you read the definition of systemic racism uh, by um, Joe Fagan and Kimberly Ducey in their book, uh, Racist America. Uh, the, that, that area is, uh, is really the, um, the area that intersects with the, with the um, juvenile justice system. And, and uh, you know, I would say in some ways DCF <clears throat> and of course across the criminal justice system in our school district. So um, for those who are on Elizabeth, those and others, um, and, um, and congratulations and welcome back with the baby Elizabeth. Um, the, um, you know, it's pretty clear we've got some problems and we're also in the middle of the biggest mental health crisis probably in our history. So I just wanted to stress the, um, the definition of systemic racism is highlighted there because that's what the premise that we're operating from. You can, you, you can just go grab that book if you want. And also reminding, and this came from the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for a More Revival, some numbers here, uh, the souls of poor folks. Uh, what it is that we're dealing with in terms of poverty, because uh, policy violence is um, is really um, when you start talking about uh, policy that it, that impacts poor people, um, we kind of know what we're talking about. So I'm going to keep moving. Uh, I think most of us know the numbers. I didn't come here to convince you of anything. There's a lot of other numbers to share. And I just brought some slides. Uh, these are uh, some of the numbers from our. Um, website, um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on hardly any of these numbers, just in the interest of time, just to get through uh, what it is that we're trying to get after. Um, I can stop here just for a few few seconds, and just in case there's something I moved through too quickly, or maybe there might be some clarity that anybody on the call may need uh, before I move on. Silence of golden. People. Silence is golden. It's a great time to get a sandwich or something too, right? <laughs> so um, I just want to just briefly just talk about a little bit of the work on platforms, policies and platforms or platforms and initiatives is what we've called them before, you know, with the backdrop of the RDAP and the um the executive director of racial equity, which we not now call the Office of uh, Racial Equity, some of the work we did in 1718. Um, but from the constitutional amendment, and we've tried several iterations of reparations, and there's been statewide policy work in the criminal justice system, and some work here in the, um, in Burlington, even on use of force, and um, the REIB office was created here, and a bunch of other stuff, but just giving some background on how we're spanning across a lot of different areas in the policy work, uh, and just give some, um, some context uh, to it, because we actually started this work in uh, the criminal justice system uh, back in 17. Um, and this is just reflective of some of the work that we've done in the Burlington area. Nobody cares about Burlington, so we'll just keep moving. Um, there's the, um, you know, definitely the uh, racism is a public health emergency, and I must have forgotten to mention that I'm, I'm also the co-chair of the Health Equity Advisory Commission uh, that was uh, born as a result of uh, this policy here. I think it was H210 back in 2000. And, uh, 21. Um, so um, Susanna uh, sits on all things equity, so we keep running into each other with that. So that's that's awesome. It's good to see the, the data folks making progress there. But the public health emergency, where there it was actually two uh, resolutions and one uh, one um, declaration. The resolution one was at the the legislature where um, there was uh, I think we call it R113. And then one was at the city council here in Burlington. And then there was a declaration that was uh, yeah, similar language uh, here. I think there may, I may have some other language. Uh, but uh, at any rate, just wanted to remind folks of that because there's some commitments that are out there. This is the R113 that I spoke about just, uh, just going over. And this is all just establishing some groundwork as far as why are we talking about um, why are we talking about disparities uh, in, in our youth? Why are we talking about mental health? Why are we talking about a need to uh, create some um, some prevention or intervention uh, capabilities? Um, you know, especially when we start talking about folks who have had previous uh, contact 
in other lives with uh, the, the um, and maybe they've, they've been justice impacted, you know, how do we, you know, figure out ways to gain access to resources, wrap around these folks? Uh, how do we, um, you know, I think all of, all of the, the groundwork that led us here is just relevant. Um, I won't talk much about the wellness working group here in the Alliance at all, um, or its activities. Uh, just suffice it to say that it, it it informed much of the work that that we um, that that we've just covered up until now, and um, I think it is worth saying that the um, you know the public health emergency work and even things like uh, you know ideas like training health professionals you know for cultural competency and leveraging aff affinity spaces and other things were things that also came out of our uh, our working our wellness working group and also. Um, informed H210, which became the Health Equity Advisory Commission, which is now uh, seeking to move forward on an Office of Health Equity at the statewide level. All of this stuff is uh, boring, but relative, uh, relevant rather. Um, there's there's even continued work on a strategic plan. And, and I'd tell you, I'd give you an overview of what has happened in the HEAC right now if I thought you'd pay attention to me long enough, but I'm going to just keep moving um, and just talk a little bit about what's going on in the Cultural Empowerment Center, which we call the Richard Kim Center, because really what we did is we found out as we began to talk about the need uh, to, um, to engage in community, which was really, I mean, we started off with Zoom calls in, uh, in 2000, uh, because we just were reaching out across the state and uh, we were really eating each other's lunch uh, on those calls, and it just occurred to a lot of folks that, you know, there's a lot of trauma that we're working through, uh, and there's a lot of challenges that folks, are, and, you know, if, if we don't have the emotional intelligence and if we don't have the, um, the healing and care that we need uh, in order to, um, to move, in order to just get level footing and to gain some stability on a personal and individual level, and, and amongst ourselves, then we're never going to be able to solve some of the bigger challenges that are ahead of us. And in the bottom line, I think that if I think if you were to write down the, the um, just one little thing that would be the um, the moral of the story is is that the the cavalry is not coming. Uh, I think that we, you know, there we do we often nudge the system and and uh, and we seek to try to pull together um, ideas and 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 transformative suggestions. You know, within the, state government, but we know we never get what we ask for it and it and it's never uh it, it never happens soon enough. Uh, so we we continue to try there, but at the same time we need to build our own systems in community and figure out ways to where we can support ourselves. So that's that's really the message in the Richard Kim Center. Um so a lot of a lot of cultural empowerment work and now what we're beginning to see is is that the work that we have been doing is beginning to get funneled through or directed towards not just um originating from us, but as we develop relationships and discover other community partners, and then we find ways in which we can uh, we can uh, port this work through the, the Richard Kemp Center, because uh, basically in the Richard Kemp Center, what we're doing is we're creating programs and services where they have historically been ineffective, inefficient, or non-existent. And, and that's, um, I think that has been our, um, our, our story. So you see, um, Many services, many of these are envisioned, some of these are in play, some of these are um, aspirational, um, but we're, where it really converges as we continue to build out programs. I have seven interns from the Burlington School District uh, working with us now to create some, some of the programming that we will see going into the next calendar year. What we really wanna do is, is we wanna just figure out how do we get our people? How do we get our people? So there's a lot of programming, and again, I said some of it aspirational, some of it in development, some of it uh, is actually in play. Um, but these are the ideas that came through um, in as we started to envision a cultural empowerment center where there's actually a footprint uh, in the city of Burlington. And for those who don't live in Burlington or not in Chittenden County, uh, that's well and fine because you know this, you know when we start talking about the Root Social Justice uh, Center. Or when we start talking about other uh, iterations of um, uh, maybe similar strategies that are uh, demographic specific, geographic specific, obviously there's always a way uh, to do this kind of work in a different context. So here, you know, understanding what systemic racism now is, is as we were, um, you know, contemplating the implementation of the Richard Kim Center, we wanted to 
I'd, I'd say harness, if you will, the um, the um, the magnitude of the challenge that we're actually dealing with. And of course, there's wealth disparities and cultural dis disempowerment uh, and across all social determinants. Um, but then, of course, uh, we also we can never, never forget the, that with the erasure and appropriation of, of, of our culture, um, that is really um, also goes directly towards the impact um, that is being created in our communities. Um, and we're seeing, you know, uh, escalations across the community. We're seeing um, uh, instability in some in some ways. And the short story is, is we have to divest uh, from failed systems and reinvest into the communities, uh, pretty much like the Kerner report said about 50 or 60 years ago. And I, I think one of the things that, you know, we had to bring it home with is in, because it, this is all of this stuff, it looks like a very simple slide, but Trust me, a lot of analysis has gone into understanding the challenge and really articulating the challenge because it's it 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 is a dip, it's difficult. It's difficult to talk about and it's difficult to articulate. But I think at the end of the day, uh, we do come to the fact that all Vermonters are um, their social health are, are, the social health of all Vermonters are jeopardized. Uh, what we know, and we've got United Nations reports indicating that racism is a threat to democracy, and I think we're seeing that play out in other ways without getting political. So the solution is, is, is essentially, you know, you've heard it before, centering the needs of the black community uh, in rectifying um, uh, the uh, historical racial inequities. And, and, and again, there's those words again, inefficient, ineffective, non-existent. Do we need some cultural brokers in our neighborhoods? Uh, we need some, some folks who can translate programs, who can nudge systems and translate programs and services and to be able to uh, de deliver them in ways that where they are most effect, more effective and, and more efficient, or where they actually do exist. Um, well, probably seven times out of ten, eight times out of ten, where services are not being reaching um, disempowered or, or disaffected communities is not because they don't exist. Uh, it's it's because um, they weren't designed effectively to the extent that they would uh, translate or actually reach uh, a lot of these communities. And this again, this is data. Um, so I won't spend a whole lot of time, more time here, but just to say that this is where this is where the concept for the Richard Kim Center came from. Um, and with that being said, um, it became increasingly clear that, you know, what we had to start to think about is, is you know, some of the other stuff um, that's happening around us. And, I, and I'll, I'll, you know, share that one of the things we're working on right now is a mentoring program um, for, you know, to, you know, I'm, I've been talking to Tom Flanagan. Uh, and I've been talking to Sparks uh, about some of the things that we could do uh, in and with and around the school system here uh, in, in this uh, district. Uh, this is not, it doesn't pertain to what you're reading right now, but uh, we know after school and mentoring um, and affinity spaces for the youth in this area are very important. We're also um, building a, a media, uh, a media justice program in conjunction uh, with some of the folks over at CCTV here. Uh, and an urban, um, an urban farming uh, program that would be uh, in conjunction with the Intervale and the folks over at um, UVM Extension as we begin to continue to pull those things together. And we've got partners in, you know, Champlain College on the media side as well, and we, we're fleshing everything out, but we're figuring out ways in which we can reach our youth where we can build our own programs in our communities. And this is pretty exciting work. I mean, I'm an old guy. I'm, I'm like 60 years old. I've got, you know, my my youngest, my oldest grandkid is 25. Uh, so I don't, I'm I'm not the guy that's going to necessarily connect with them, despite the fact that I've been uh, kind of mentoring these seven 14-year-olds um, for the last uh, three or four weeks, which has helped me to sleep well at night. So here here's the with the credible messengers. Um, well, this is a concept, but it's also a movement, you know, a successful movement in uh, many of the major cities across uh, America. I'm pretty sure Susana has probably heard talk of credible messengers in New York City uh, prior to coming down. Many of you others have heard of other iterations of um, types of um, programs where there are folks who have been previously uh, justice impacted, where they've uh, turned and pivoted and, and sought to move back in, in, into and support um, youth struggling in communities. So this is uh, support and assistance at, at risk, uh, justice impacted youth and young adults. So again, we're traversing 
the, uh, the so-called criminal justice and juvenile justice systems. Uh, so this would even potentially even extend into school um, standardized programming, um, including in this, what this means is, is these are, these are the types of training that our credible messengers uh, would first inform, first receive, but also be transmitting. Um, and that's, um, you know, how do we help our youth reach self-actualization, -act uh, dealing with things like mental hygiene and centeredness, communication and health, family and community awareness, emotional literacy and the like. And so there's, there's a lot of stuff, uh, purpose and productivity, but at the end of the day, put together a plan to create a plan and live by a plan. And it's, this is just one um, dimension, if you will, of what we view cred credible messengers to be. We've got a great uh, trainer uh, in Mr. Feeble, who's currently rolling a credible messenger out across the entire state of New Jersey. Uh, he'll, he'll be in, in town. Um, he's, uh, we're in a queue for some training of a handful of messengers here. We're creating logo. Uh, uh, as I said, I've spoken to um, various representatives from, I would say almost everyone that's, that's, that's here seated uh, on the, uh, on the uh, RDAP just to kind of give folks a heads up and, and just, again, informational. Um, and I, what I've learned, is, if, if there's nothing that I haven't learned is, is just do it, do it, and then then figure out how to pay for it. So even over at the Howard Center, we've had conversations over there, of course, in the mental health and corrections, had a great conversation with Nick Dimmel. Um, and uh, yeah, so all of these, all of these areas, even Rachel and uh, United Way Northwest, even Monica Hutt, many, many others just having conversations. Let's talk about it. Let's socialize it. Let's, um, let's make it happen. Let's make it a reality. Um, as far as the credible messengers, uh, the credible messengers framework is concerned, um, what this really is is, okay, um, what's next? What are you doing? What are you going to do? And what are you going to do after that? So recruiting and training is, is a big one. Uh, we've got a handful of folks here in in Chittenden County who've expressed interest and who have stepped up. Probably about well, probably about five or six, seven at the most on a good day have showed up uh, and expressed interest. And as you can see, it's kind of hard to get your head around at first. Um, and like, there's a, a thousand questions and I hope you don't ask all thousand of them um, that can come up around this as far as, you know, how do we get this done? Um, community resource assessment, uh, program implementation, that's the basic rollout. So I, I would say right now we're kind of, we're, 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 at, we're, we're training and the resource assessment is, is just a continuous uh, process. And I would say, the program implementation, uh, that's something that just depends on how you look at it and what you want to call it, because there are a lot of folks, if you know, as you know, who they just live their lives like this. They're already out there. We're already out there engaging youth. We're already, we see youth every day. Somebody walks in the door every day. The phone rings every day. In fact, we've got a, an, an apparatus that we deployed about three years ago uh, called uh, Rapid Response, uh, which is a, a place on our website where folks can go out and reach out. And we've got a, a director about uh, community engagement and support that manages that process. Um, but again, uh, the network strengthening and the wraparound piece is, is again, I, I think that's that's more about digging a little bit deeper uh, into some of the existing community resources, some of the colleges and universities, um, develop, develop uh, continuing to develop the relationships and, and driving those um, partnerships uh, with the existing systems. Again. It's a little bit of a tap dance because what we got to do is we got to show up um, in, in a way in which it's important the, to have the important conversations that, hey, look, we all want the same thing. And, and the reason why it's important to have the conversation about systemic racism and those outcomes and the fact that things are not working in black and brown communities on a level that they need to, and we're talking about a generational issue or challenge rather, the reason why those conversations are so incredibly important is, is look folks, we can't continue to pretend like everything's okay because it's not. And, but at the same time, we can't, you know, we don't get there from here by, by making, by putting somebody else on the defense and making them justify what it is that they're doing. And there's a natural propensity to want to do that understandably. So it's a little bit of a tap dance because at the end of the day, we've got to partner with the folks that are currently doing the services. A designated agency is a designated agency, period. Uh, so there's a, there's a little bit of a dance that we do, 
and that we'll continue to do. Uh, it's not it's not easy work uh, because you can imagine uh, some of the challenges that may come with that. But at, I think at the end of the day, we're making progress. And and I, I think, um, yeah, I think we're moving forward. So I think in, in closing, and this will be the last slide I share with you, is, is that uh, as far as uh, what's going on there, it is important for us to catalog uh, what we have uh, just as far as resource inventory. Um, and, and cultivate those relationships, and, and that continues here. It's, it's, it's lucky that we're in, that I, I'm in Burlington because there's an incredible amount of cultivation happening, uh, particularly in UVM and in Champlain. We haven't really penetrated St. Michael's as much, um, and um, and then also uh, with the um, and, and the reason why that's really important is for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, data, 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 data. We're going to always be coming back to data because everything that we do is going to be outcomes based. It's, it's got to be data driven. It's got to be results oriented. And, and some of these um, some of these methodologies that we're using, particularly when we get to about that 5% of stuff that we're doing that it would be deemed to be clinical, uh, we want to make sure that it's rock solid. So we're, you know, I'm even engaging with a number of clinicians in, in the local area and in a number of forums where clinicians reside or where they're interacting and so forth. Again, train the trainer, that's going to be coming up really soon. That may even start even here in the month of August. Um, the social consciousness education uh, and the credible messenger approach is really the first uh, two areas. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, going to, we're going to be doing some behavioral health training, train the trainer. Of course, everybody's going to need some uh, administrative training. And there's this, there's this um, approach called new entry, which is the takeoff of re-entry that's credible messenger oriented. At the end of the day, the numbers, and I don't want to quote them, but I heard something ridiculous, like the numbers were up close to about, and I mean re-entry numbers, were up somewhere close to about 80%. And I'll get the actual numbers, so please don't quote me on these numbers. But I, I heard that once the credible messengers were implemented, uh, in uh, certain areas that they had plummeted uh, down the areas that were in the teens. So I'll, I'll validate that, back it up. I'm doing some additional um, research. Talent acquisition and base building is where we go from there. That pretty much concludes what I came to tell you. I just wanted to, like I said, I wanted to inform you of some of the work that we're doing uh, because I realized that we'll be doing it together most everybody on this call in some way or another, it will be important for, for us and our folks uh, to have visibility of relationship with uh, trust relationships built um, and the whole, the whole nine yards with, um, with, with the entire system. Uh, I even, I even uh, had a great conversation with Judge Zoni, um, who, who, uh, who was pretty impressed. He had a few questions as well. Um, but uh, I'm, let me pause there. Um, no, I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to say that um, I appreciate the time. And again, um, I'm I'm available for conversation one on one too. So if we want to short circuit, if you got something that you feel like you just want to unpack, um, then what we can do is is we can just set up some time, and you and I, I can you know we can meet up. I mean, I'm so tired of Zoom. Um, and thank you, Aaron, for sitting down with me in Montpelier uh, before the flood. Um, and we can have, you know, we can talk it through, but I'm, I'm just curious to hear if there's any, at least have I provoked any thought, or uh, is there any, are there any, um, similar programs that you've seen, or do you, ha do you just have any direct questions of me understanding I may not have an answer? I have a direct question. Uh-oh. Well, no, 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 just, to, I, it, it's not evil. It, it, <laughs> no, I'm just, where are you getting your funding? So fu funding is funding is coming from health. It's coming from here local in 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 Burlington. It's coming from um, well, when I say health, I'm talking about VDH, um, and um, it's coming from um, outside pri private donors, uh, regular um, contributors um, by hook or by crook. But we do a lot of stuff free. Okay. Um, and what I mean by that is is that we've got. We also have a lot of volunteers, and we've got a lot of folks that are just deeply committed uh, to the work. And it, it has been our tradition, it's been our history that mo 
more times than not, we will lean in on the work even before we figure out how to pay for it. Okay. So I think the stupid answer is, is that um, we're hoping that as we continue this work and we, and we start to create, um, you know, for example, I know for sure that the mental health department is going to want to fund part of this work. I know for sure that probably someone out of um, Aaron Jacobson's uh, neck of the woods may at some point or another put some money towards this, this work. I know for sure that maybe somebody out of um, uh, Nick Demmel's area may, so at some point or another, we'll come to those conversations, but this is not an ask for money at this point. This is just a, um, this is just a situational awareness uh, type of thing. So when, I, when we do come back and we say, hey, we're really doing this, can we like squeeze a couple of nickels together? It won't be a, a difficult conversation. And we'll also have some, we'll have some evidence to show that we're, what we're doing is effective. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca. Mark, I just want to say thank you for uh, bringing this to us tonight. Uh, I really appreciate it. I'm a long time admirer of the work you guys have been doing. I've known you for a long time, but I learned a lot seeing these, these, these very, these, all this work you guys are doing put forth in these slides. It's very, very impressive. Uh, I hope you are willing to share these slides with us. Uh, we have sort of an ongoing, uh, you know, we update this co collective document of source material from around the state of uh, reports and things like that uh, uh, from addressing these issues. So this would fit right in if you're willing. But I also appreciated, because uh, my takeaway from yours, your slides was, uh, similar to what we strive to do, whether it's the data project or our current projects or, or, or just even how the makeup of this panel is. And I'm sorry to miss so many of our community members tonight. It's great to have so many people here. And, and I see a lot of people, familiar faces from government. But what I took away from your, your slides and all important with this, addressing these huge issues, systemic racism, et cetera, is, is always, always, always centering the community impacted, right? Whether it's it's not doing anything without them being a part, listening to them, having 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 their voices uh, always at the forefront. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Yeah. Comments? I'm sorry, Mark. Go ahead. No, I was just saying thanks to Rebecca. Rebecca and I go way back, so she's like an old buddy of mine. So of course, you know, I'm I'm just so happy to see that you're still here. Um, I thought they have driven you out of your mind by now. I've tried not to. Uh, <laughs> anyone else? Uh, Jennifer Pullman. Thank you. I'm just a community member. So um, just asking in terms of curiosity. Um, thank you, Reverend Hughes, for your um, presentation. And um, I've seen you via YouTube many times. So um, really learn a lot every time I hear from you. Uh, I'm just curious as to whether you work, I'm guessing you do, with the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, and also what that looks like for victims of crime, because I know that we work really closely with them as a subgrantee and trying to work with victims who, you know, don't show up, and how do we make that space? And a lot of the times that, you know, Fata shares that, it's creating a guarding opportunity for victims to come forward and they, they just work together and they talk about their stuff with each other. And I just wanna, again, that's my hat. I have worked with young people um, on the defense side, but my hat is to think about how do we engage victims um, and survivors who are in a place where they're not heard and just wanna know a little bit more about your work in that area. Jennifer, it's good to see you. Can can you please uh, just restate the question? Just because um, I think I heard something about AALV, but also heard something about victims, and I just want to make sure that I answer your question. Yes, I think that um, I guess my question was a little bit more like all over the place, so I'll be more clear. Um, we work with AL, a, a ALV and other organizations that try and figure out how we can do a better job in terms of reaching victim survivors who also are not always victim survivors. They've also been, um, you know, nothing's, everything's gray now, but how we reach out to folks that don't 
feel that they can engage with the criminal justice system. And so I'm wondering about your work with those individuals. Um, again, a AALB does a great job about figuring out different ways to engage folks. Again, it's the gardening project that they do. And I'm just wondering where, where that work is, if it is on your spectrum. Oh yeah, okay, thank you for that. And, and I, I really, I, I like this question a lot uh, because I, I think that it's um, the delineation between the uh, indigenous African-American community uh, and the refugee resettlement and migrant community um, is an important conversation for us to, um, to have and for it to be ongoing. And I think we need to stop uh, being so uh, terrified of it. I, my, my wife has lived in Vermont since 1973, and she has five siblings, and her, her father um, intentionally came here um, and settled in here. He was the late Richard Kemp. And I think that, um, you know, what my wife has taught me and, and what the relationships that I've been able to cultivate since I've been here have, have taught me is, is that there's a, there's a pretty significant division. Um, so that's one of the, the, you know, that's one of the, the underlying goals of the work of the Richard Kim Center. Yes, I know Jacob very, very well. I know Tato very, very well. Uh, I know Sandy Baird very, very well. Uh, I know uh, Amelia, uh, Amelia at USCRI very, very well. Uh, and, but there are a lot of disparate or, or diverging uh, things that are happening at the same time. There is a different flavor of people who don't feel safe with the police in the indigenous African American community, but we're still here. Uh, and the solution to it is not necessarily what ALV has because it's different. It's a different culture. It's a different cultural uh, uh, aspect of what's, what we're uh, dealing with. And you know, I, I have a personal goal in, 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 as a community member and a resident here of Burlington and North Burlington, um, a, a, a commitment to um, continue to do the work to unify us because there, we have way more in common uh, than um, most people uh, realize, particularly when it comes to the impact uh, of systemic racism, that is to say the legacy of slavery. Um, because, um, you know, because of this, I think that um, we should probably take a conversation offline and, and figure out, um, you know, how do we, you know, how do we, with our unique needs, um, are, which are completely consistent with the needs that you're addressing in another community with people who look like us, um, how do we partner with somebody like you or others like you? And this goes directly to um, the point I was making earlier where it's difficult to, sometimes it's a challenging conversation sometimes to have with a person that's providing programs and services in communities, but they're not reaching us. And remember, I said that a little while ago that it's very difficult to have that conversation because it's easy for somebody like a Jennifer to say, well, wait a minute, um, I'm doing everything I can, or, or wait a minute, um, and, and uh, naturally have a knee jerk um, response to say, I'm going to be defensive as opposed to saying, oh, oh and, no, so I didn't say problem. that. I want to do more, and I think I'm trying to learn. And I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that that's what you took from what I asked. Um, what I was asking is how we can be a better part of the conversation. I think your response to what I just said is reflective of the point I was making. Is is that there's no need for you to be defensive. And I, in fact, I didn't even say that. Um, what I what I was doing is I was using you as an example and using uh, exactly the point that you made. Uh, as an example, reflecting on something that I just said probably about 20 minutes ago and how we deal with our community partners that are currently delivering services, but we're not necessarily reaching them. It's a tap dance. And yeah, um, what that means is, is that we have these conversations and sometimes somebody will say, oh, well, have you, did you, uh, what about AALV or what about this community? And then we have to have a difficult conversation that says, yeah, um, we're experiencing the same things. We have the same challenges. We're just not receiving the same services. And we have to have that conversation in a way to where whoever's delivering those services or, or whoever it is that we're having those conversations with, receive it in a way where it's not critical 
and they receive it in a way where they say, well, it's informational and I'm learning just as Jennifer, as you just said, you're learning. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to having more conversations with you. Um, again, it's not personal, um, but there is still work to be done in this area to reach the, the communities that I'm targeting. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I sure do appreciate you giving me an opportunity to come and, and speak to y'all and, and I appreciate the conver uh, conversation, uh, the follow-ups. I'm gonna say it one more time and I'm gonna drop it in the chat before I leave. But I will, um, I wanna cordially invite you and, and just really urge you to come out the first African landing day uh, this year. It's a, it's where the, the 1619 project in the 400 year African American history commissions work uh, intersect. And um, this is again, the fifth year uh, that we've, we've done this work. And it's really just a commemoration and it's about cultural empowerment. It's about our contribution. It's about our, uh, our resilience above all. And it's, it's guaranteed to, um, to uh, really lighten your heart and it's, it's about all of us. So please do everything you can to pass it on to others and, and show up. And again, a time um, blessings to you. And thank you so much, my friend, for giving me the opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. Be well. All right. Um, hello. Um, let us proceed. I, this is obviously a piecemeal agenda this evening. I'm kicking and going. Um, I'd like to do the approval of the minutes from the May meeting. Yes, May. Um, and that should take us a few moments, um, depending on you know whether people have corrections, addenda, whatever that needs to be made. This is the moment to weigh in. Anything from anyone? I realized it was a while ago. No. Okay. Using our modified Roberts rules, anybody want to make a motion? Sure, Aton. I would move that we pass the minutes as written. Great. Thank you. Anyone want to second that? I'll second Jen Furpo. Great. Thank you. Then let us vote. All in favor of passing the minutes as written and submitted, please indicate in some form, given that this is Zoom. Raise your Aye. hand. Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. I'm looking through two screens here. Got it. Um, everybody who is opposed. Everybody who is abstaining. Okay, Grant, you have the sound. Grant? Uh, you have the sound. Okay, thank you. Um, the minutes are accepted as, as they have been presented to us. Thank you. Um, bunch of announcements. And let us go through those. Um, I've already told you who's absent. Um, I didn't manage because she came on a bit later. Um, Tiffany, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I apologize. I had a whole situation. Um, it seems like every time, every program that I need, I have to contact IT for. <laughs> so I'm on my home computer right now. Um, but it's wonderful to see all of your faces. Um, I don't know how much of an introduction you want. I don't take up too much time, but just welcoming you all from the new division that you all helped create. So I'm looking forward to um, being a part of this, this meeting. Laura is also here with us. I, I, she may have introduced herself. She has, uh, but would you like to tell us, uh, you know, go, between the two of you, yeah. um, let us know. Because yeah. no one has met anybody yet and um, oh, okay. lovely to do so. Yeah. Yes. 
So so I'm going to say a few words. Well, first of all, I just want to say we brought um, Laura on. Very thankful to have her. Um, She's coming in from DOC. She's also had a lot of experience with the state archives. And so it's going to be tremendous. I think the work that we can do together. Um, I'm bringing, I'm coming from a public health background, but I've always kind of had a kind of a hand and an interest in the area of criminal justice. And I think it, um, I was actually having this conversation earlier. It's been beautiful to see the way that public health is embracing this topic. Whereas I think years ago, when I first became interested, there was definitely like a kind of a hands-off, at least kind of how I experienced it. Um, so for me, it's interesting and it's, um, really kind of a coming together for me personally to be a part of this effort. Um, but I have a lot to learn. Um, and I'm hoping that I can do a lot of good work um, with Susanna, with ORE, with all of you. Um, and I don't want to take the stage because I think Laura, um, I, I don't know if we're going to have time today, depending upon your schedule for our day to present. Um, but Laura may want to say a few words to you um, just to talk about herself. She's kind of my co-partner. I did a little bit of an introduction earlier, but just to um, bounce off a little bit of what uh, Tiffany said for my background. So I did come over from the Department of Corrections. I was the records and information management specialist there. Um, and prior to that, I did records management for the entire agency of human services. So I have a pretty solid landscape on AHS and the different departments there, um, and especially corrections. Um, I'm also excited to learn more things. Criminal justice and racial justice have always been really big passion areas of mine. Um, and I'm also very excited to be here. So thank you again for having me. Thank you both. Great. Okay. Onward with the announcements then. Um, there's a lot that's gone on and I need to inform you of, I did not write endless emails because it was just stretched out over too long a period of time. Um, given all that has happened within the state and I'm, namely sort of speaking of the flood, um, I have asked for an extension on the submission of our report. Um, given that many of you I know are not even allowed in your offices without some lengthy, strange bureaucratic process to get at your computers and such, I just thought that made sense. Um, uh, I don't think um, that this will be a problem. Um, I think that some of what we'll likely include in the report is already on the legislative radar, and the big issue there would be certainly the second look legislation. Um, and I just wanted to point that out, that I don't think that asking for this is going to put us out of the cycle of testimony and such uh, when the session gets going. So that was my first big thing to let you know. Um, it just seemed that that was the most reasonable thing to do, given that people were in extremists, as it were. Um, again, then the report, I would certainly, as I have said before, would like to start drafting even just it, not anything word perfect. I don't care about periods and commas because we're all going to look at it and have comments on whatever we come up with. But it is definitely time to start doing that. Um, the holidays, and I realize this sounds very strange to be mentioning on August 8th, are not really that far away, okay? And certainly not for a group that meets for two hours as a complete body once a month. And you all know how we get during the holidays. I am not saying this critically. I say this with love but we know how we get during the holidays. It ends up turning into another August, right? <laughs> Where everybody's out and got family commitments and stuff like that, and that's fine. But that's why I'm pointing out, I think we need to start drafting things now because it's gonna come up, no matter how much time we get, it's gonna happen quickly. And I really think that that's why I wanna emphasize the idea of starting to make paragraphs. Um, let's see, I will, oh, right. And then finally, I had um, offered in an er earlier email to work on translating my resume, my verbal resume of the, I guess, what would be the word? 
successes and successes in waiting, perhaps, from our 2019 report um, into a verbal report to give to the panel again to edit, to you know, do whatever edit needs. Um, I have not done that yet. I have started on it. And I will get that to you. I will continue to do that. I didn't hear anybody say, don't do that, um, which is what I had written in the email. <laughs> so I just started on it because we really didn't have time to go back and forth. So if that's not what anybody wants and there's a reason not to want it, that's fine. Let me know now and I'll stop. Um, but I do think it's important that we go back and create a link to our previous work. Um, we, ha Tim. Oh, I'm sorry. Finish your thought. I was just going to compliment that strategy. I think it's a great idea. Okay. This was an idea that we had stemming from God back a long time ago that one of the, our chief things was to protect the work product. That was indeed the 2019 report. So I view that resume as part of that. Um, I don't really want to get as formal as to take a vote on it. I don't think that there's a need to, but if you've got, res if you, there's resistance, if there is feedback someone wants to give, please look back at the email I sent and send that out and we can go from there. And there may be a moment for a vote. I just don't think it's right now. Um, Let's see, the last bit that I want to inform you of, and this involves um, not only ORE, but more specifically the division um, of racial justice statistics. Uh, there's a long story here, and I won't get into the whole thing because it'll take hours. Um, it involves what was H270 last session and is now Act 65, I believe. Um, on cannabis, there was a request that there be a report that was extensively technical having to do with racial inequity and cannabis use. And it really got pretty technical into cannabis. Um, there was a miscommunication between Reverend Hughes and I. Um, and what got back to Senator Vyhovsky was that we were, that was certainly something in our purview, and I had said that. Indeed, I did say that to Mark. Um, I said what I remember saying was absolutely, um, that's certainly, you know, in our wheelhouse as the RDAP, but I didn't hear him say anything about a report due on January 15th. As you can imagine, I had a cow, um, like a real cow. Um, and um, I mean, there's someone to milk here now. Um, it was not good. Um, but then it occurred to me, wait, there's the division. Let's see what they can get going on this. Now, I don't think that, I, I don't know. I don't want to speak for Tiffany um, and, and, and um, Laura or Susanna. But it looks like a heavy lift to me. But they were really happy. They were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Tiffany was just like, okay, we're on this. And Pepper then, who, you know, we all perhaps remember from his tenure on this panel, forwarded all the stuff that the Cannabis Control Board had on this topic to the division. And uh, they are at work on this. Um, so it was a weird way of, in a strange way of getting our cake and eating it too, um, and with milk. And so I, <laughs> I felt that um, I, I, I didn't tie you all into this because oh my god, who wants this an email about this, right? Am I right? You all would have shot me if I had written this up as a narrative. It would have been terrifying. So I didn't. I just did it. I'm sorry if I've stepped on toes. If I wasn't transparent, I just needed to get this. I mean, I was so freaked out at the notion of we can't write two reports at once. We don't even know what we're talking about. I mean, it's like, you know, coming to the RDAP and going, and so what do you all feel about racial equity and car mechanics? 
I don't know. We are not car mechanics. Um, it, it So it was a little bit strange. But anyway, it's taken care of. Tiffany and Laura and ORE are on it. Um, I, I don't know. I feel happy. I need to get in touch with Senator Bajowski and let her know that this is going on. She has a sense. Um, they really didn't want us to kill the bill. And I understand that. And I said, that's fine. But we need to have a chat after this. And so this is where we are. Um, any questions? about the report, the cow, anything. Tyler. Lots of questions about the cow, but um, ah! that, those are for offline. Um, <laughs> I appreciate, I just wanted to say that I appreciate your initiative, Aton, and Thank kind you. of moving that forward and making that connection. Um, and speaking of initiative, it's just, it's exciting to hear that the reaction um, it, over in the division and with Tiffany and Susanna Shop and Laura of saying like, Oh, this is fantastic. Let's roll our sleeves up. This is this this is what we're here for is exciting to me. And I think this is a good example of um the mechanics of something that were put together from a vision in this room that I was once in, right. um, coming to fruition in a way that is productive and useful. And uh so I others might feel differently, but from my perspective, I'm grateful for the initiative you showed in that. Thank you. Rebecca. Um, yeah, I'm not so I I didn't get a chance to look at the fine print on this uh, bill and now act, but did you say that the RDAP is still responsible for filing this report, even though we have the data division? It's help. Oh, no. Got it. We're off the we're off the. Okay. This, Got it. This Thanks for the be, clarification. Yes, this is going to be gravy for Senator Vyhovsky and the legislature. And a chance for the legislature to get to know the work of the division. I just wondered if this was something we were putting on our fall agenda of reviewing. Oh my God, no! Adopt it or not? All right, great. No, Thank you. No, I wouldn't do. I was trying. <laughs> my entire goal was not to do this to the panel. <laughs> Thank you. I just was like, yeah, no, this is. I, I we can't. You should have seen me. It was really frightening. Um. I was a little too strident, perhaps. Um, anybody else? And I have to say, Tiffany, I've got to just like praise you and worship you here. You were remarkable because I was coming to a part. I mean, I was literally freaking out. I was on the phone with my therapist. You were like, yeah, this will be great. This will be really kind of cool. We can do, I mean, you were just all bubbly about it. And I was like, Okay, she's and, insane. All right, fine. You know, I mean, <laughs> no, it's. I mean, it gives us something to um, kind of dig into to start with. Laura has done, I will say, a lot of the heavy lifting, and we still have some conversations to be had um, before we have a presentation um, to you and to this group, if you if you so choose. Um, Absolutely. Next but Absolutely. we're really excited. I mean, I think, um, Laura, I don't know if you want to say a few words about um, or a preview about the presentation that we have. Um, so, um, the, as you mentioned, Aton, the materials from Pepper that we got as a, an office um, spent a lot of my first, I've only been with the office for about a month now. So I spent a lot of my first early weeks um, reviewing and reading that and then basically um, identifying um, like areas of opportunity and different research gaps so that we can um, figure out where we need to kind of fill in in, in our division as far as gathering data. Um, and then I also, uh, Tiffany and I walked through different questions that we have for CCD as well. And maybe some of these are questions that might be um, questions that this group has also, but that's kind of where we've started. So obviously, like I, Tiffany said, we have a little bit more work obviously to do, but sure. that's where we're at. Sure. I think right now leaving it off of the RDAPS plate directly is a good idea. Um, but having said that, we're going to go back to you and Tiffany, Laura, because, and Susanna, you were going to introduce the next um, section, which is about I, what the division's doing. Yes? Yeah, that's correct. Super quick um, intro because I'm going to let Laura and Tiffany take over. 
Um, so we have really tried to hit the ground running with DRJS, but um, math is hard and so is data. So um, just when we think we kind of understand everything, we discover another RDAP report or a report from an adjacent entity and we realize that it's this it is a cavernous world. So we are um, really working our way through the information and through the body of work product that you all and your respective um, departments have put out. So a couple of the projects that we've, a couple of the early projects that the DRJS has been working on include um, lending a hand with some of the research around cannabis equity and um, ways in which the historical treatment of people in the United States may or may not have created racial disparities. <laughs> we know they did. Um, with respect to um, drug law enforcement. Another thing that we're doing is building um, kind of a, a just compendium slash repository um, of sources and information that we think will be uh, helpful in, in this work going forward. So I am going to turn it over to Laura and Tiffany so that they can brief you uh, on a little bit of what they've been working on. Thank you, Susanna. Okay, Eitan, may I share my screen? Actually, that's Erin, because she's the one who knows how to push buttons better than I do. Oh, I, think, I see it. I have the option. I think you can, Tiffany, yeah. Oh, see, I don't even know that. <laughs> Let me know if what you see. Um... Looks great. Okay, okay. Beautiful. We have... You know, it's hard to follow, I think. Um... The presentation before us gave me a lot to think about and just understanding what's already happening in Vermont. So I think we will use this as a um, a learning space as well um, to inform our work. So I appreciate that discussion. Um, so yeah, so we are launching um, this division. I think with your help, um, we're um, Laura and I put together this presentation and we just wanna run through um, Kind of what we're focused on a lot of it you have already heard already because a lot of it you have um put in your various reports um in terms of kind of what you want us to be doing um and we have a few things that we're throwing in to kind of give you a sense of where we're going at the at the moment um so let's our agenda and it i'm thinking it may take about 15 minutes but please you know, feel free, stop us if you have questions. No, I think we're, yeah, we're gonna be fine. Okay, okay. So we'll just introduce ourselves again um, a little more fully, um, talk about our primary goals, our areas of focus, next steps, and then Laura will talk a little bit about, um, or give a little bit of a preview regarding the CCD assessment. Um, and hopefully we can present that to you in a few weeks. Um, so yeah, so right now it's me and Laura. Um, very happy with what's happening in terms of the ideas we're generating and just what we've been talking about. I, I feel like we, we have a really good um, start to this effort. So I'm really, really proud. Um, I know we have a lot of work to do. I know that we haven't seen it all yet, <laughs> but, but I am excited and I, I feel hopeful. Um, hopefully that sustains. I think we, we're going to see a lot during this process. We're expecting two more analysts. We have one already funded under what you all have brought to the table. We also have this third analyst and many of you may be familiar um, via the DCF MOU um, that will be coming on board as well. So we're really building a team here um, that I think can really do great work. This is a whole bunch of stuff about me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my foundation is just really wanting to understand the determinants of health very broadly. Um, I bring a background in biology, health, um, biomedical sciences, um, but I've learned so much about how all of these things are connected. Um, even when we think about epigenetics, we think about stressors, we think about um, the criminal just justice system. Um, and I think we're gonna find ways to kind of bring these spaces, talking about health, talking about criminal justice, um, hopefully I can inform a little bit of that discussion. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more. We actually have a UVM abstract where we will be talking about 
um, criminal justice and public health? And how do we think about that as a health issue? Um, so hopefully, yeah, I won't go into too much detail, but that's where my passion work is. Um, yeah, I've done a lot of work, research admin, um, project management, um, stats. Um, and yeah, and my kind of where my my first, I think, I feel like it was an experiential learning experience, uh, was a teaching prison program um, at UC Berkeley. I come to find out it's still in existence, which is really wonderful to hear that um, after 20 years, they're still doing the work. Um, I think they closed down for COVID, but have are relaunching the program. Um, but I learned so much and I, and I, I shared this in my interview. Um, one of the things that's, that stuck with me and it still sticks with me through all these years. And that's why I've kind of been turning in circles a little bit when it comes to choosing what I want to work on and what I want to be a part of. Um, trajectories. Um, so one of the things, it was partly a program where we went to San Quentin, we did GED prep and other activities, um, but we also had a learning component. So it was kind of, I think it was in the Department of Education and, um, you know, the statistics that they would talk about, like the fact that we could look at eight-year-olds in Oakland and we could predict the percentage that would be in San Quentin by the time, you know, 10 years from now or when they turned 18. So that was, um, that always stuck with me. You know, if we can predict it, we can prevent it, hopefully. Um, so that's also informing um, kind of how I approach this work. Um, so yeah, so I did my undergraduate out in California also earned uh, a master of public health, um, chronic disease epidemiology, but you'd be, you'd be surprised to know how much this work informs that as well. There's a lot of interplay that we don't talk about. Um, and then also I have a degree in biomedical sciences. So that's what I'm bringing to the table. Um, and then I also want Laura to talk a little bit about herself because she's also, we're working together. I think her experience um, complements mine and she's bringing in a, a lot um, with her experience at DOC and State Archives. So I'm gonna let her pop in here. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it short and sweet so I'm not too repetitive for the other introductory pieces I've already shared. But um, I, like I mentioned before, I'm very passionate about racial and social justice. Um, and as well as data and information governance, um, coming from a records management background, I have that information governance kind of built into my my um, toolkit. So I'm really excited to um, continue to apply that here with, as Tiffany and I work on developing data governance plans for different um, strategies we have for collecting information for our projects. Um, as Tiffany has mentioned, I was first started in Vermont state government in 2018. Um, I worked for the state archives um, as a records and information management, uh, assisting the entire agency of human services on, on developing record schedules, implementing records management programs, um, and really uh, teaching people that it's okay to um, get rid of things and delete your email uh, when appropriate. I'll just, as a caveat, say that is more importantly. Um, and then from there, I moved into the Department of Corrections doing similar work as the records and information management specialist. I was also heavily involved in um, the grievance system and helping the department move into an electronic grievance system after our after the state auditor's office um, did an audit on the Department of Corrections um, grievance system. So um, yeah, so I'm very excited to now be with the Office of Racial Equity in this role. Uh, I have a background in, math, uh, in library science and um, uh, literature and yeah, just happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, this is the full team. <laughs> so I feel like even though we have a division, um, we're always, Jay, Shalini, Susanna are going to be integral in working with us. Um, so that's really the full team, if you really think about the division. And of course, we have these two analysts coming on. Um, Susanna has hinted about a an administrative assistant. So we're hoping. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think then we'll 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 be rolling because we have just a lot of things that we're trying to keep a hold of and um just the extra support is always going to be wonderful. Um so yeah. And about the division, so we already kind of said this. Um so yeah, I love this quote. Um I've been reading this book. I'm not certain that I'm 
it's the whole long story, but this is a quote that I think is informative. Um, yeah, if data are not available, um, how do we have informed policy? Um, yeah, and if we, we're we not seeing it's kind of the self-fulfilling cycle that it's assumed that certain topics are not important. Um, so yeah, so I think that's kind of guiding us as we do this work. Um, so primary goals, you actually probably wrote this, this part of it, um, collecting and analyzing data related to systemic bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems, um, leveraging relevant data sets and informing policy decisions so that we can ameliorate um, some of the disparities that um, as we find them, we would hope to um, inform the um, policy as, as appropriate. Um, so here are some of the deliverables that we inherited <laughs> from um, as we came on board and that we are um, recognizing. I think as we're thinking about it, kind of the key deliverable that is keeping us motivated and excited excited um, is this public facing website. We really want to get to that point. And so I think that everything that we're doing, we're trying to figure out, okay, how do we make a resource that is publicly available? Maybe we even host community meetings around it. Um, we are able to track what's happening over time in these, these different systems in terms of disparities. Um, so I think that focus is really informing what we're doing around data collection and research and data governance. Um, so yeah, creating these MOUs as an initial step, inventory of assets, um, gap analyses, um, strategic plans, um, various reports to you, to um, the legislative uh, the legislature, um, and in the process, I think we're Laura will play a huge role in terms of doing the tracing, uh, functional analysis, kind of as we're looking at the various data sets, kind of seeing what has informed those data sets. How do we go back to how they were created? Um, so I won't go into too much detail because we have a few slides to get through. Uh, data governance policy recommendations on improving data collection around these um, racial and ethnic. We we have to do better, I think. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of how we're thinking about it, planning, doing the data collection, visualizations and designs. Ideally, we would have a soft launch with the folks who are providing data sets to us. Um, so once we have a dashboard created in partnership with ADS, we want to make sure that all of our partners feel included, that whatever we put as a public facing website makes sense. Um, and I know that's going to be an entire process. And I, I think you know, there may be things that could potentially be controversial, but I think we want to work through that in a positive way um, and then hopefully launch the dashboard. And, and that may be a year away, year plus away, depending upon <laughs> how things go. Hey, time shaking. Yeah, you're shaking your head. <laughs> um, I'm going to run through these. I know Laura's going to jump in because she's uh, been heavily involved in a lot of these pieces. Um, this is something that we... I, you know, I've been looking at different examples of what other states are doing, and this, I feel, is remarkable. Um, I want to say it's a nonprofit who developed um, the dashboard. What's most impressive, I think, what caught my eye, because I was looking at videos around, like, criminal justice, equity, and I ran across this video where... Um, I just felt like it was very inclusive because the video started with someone who you would think, you know, as you're starting the video, you would think he's an attorney. Um, and then he started talking about the fact that he had served 10 years, um, incarcerated 10 years and how he kind of was, um, um, you know, how you have, I say prison scholars basically was the one reading all the, the books and helping people with their cases. And so he started to see disparities when he people would come to him and say hey you know how do I handle this case how many how much time do you think I have so as he started looking at these cases one by one started to say hey wait a minute this person did the same thing as this person but they got different sentences and so um, I think while he was in prison reached out to an attorney who works in this space um, they had a conversation um, and now basically 
they linked up with someone at Microsoft and came up with this dashboard. So I feel like it's a really good um, representation of the things we might want to do as we think about having a public facing website. Um, this it's interactive. Um, this particular snapshot shows conviction proportionality. So you can see um, the counties where you have more, um, you know, disproportionate, disproportionate rates of conviction for uh, Black Americans. You also have, um, you know, the, yeah, data that we care about that I think this whole group is very familiar with in terms of like, you know, you if you're represented at 3.9% of the population, why are you convicted at 13.3%? Those kinds of things. Um, this dashboard has made very visible. Um, this is another snapshot. Um, this actually goes, this shows sentencing disparities by judge. Um, so you kind of see that one that's like that peak right there. Um, so I think I, I have a lot of work to do too, to kind of see how they have managed. First of all, I think the first step that so many states lack is actually having the data on race, ethnicity, and convictions and sentencing. But now they have a full dashboard. So now the question is, what are they doing with this dashboard and this data? What actions are coming around that? So I, I think that's where I have to do a little more homework. Um, and also just giving you guys a heads up, because I think some of this stuff we, we have to talk through as we're presenting some of the data and kind of what makes what makes sense, but I think this is a very interesting um, dashboard to follow. Um, here are some of our legislative committees and working groups that we're a part of right now. Um, we have joined one that is looking at intellectual disabilities in relation to housing in the community versus um, they're trying to develop a potential um, facility trying to figure out how to handle folks who are who may have intellectual disabilities. Um, so that that's an interesting working group to be a part of. Um, S14, you probably are all very familiar with. Um, that's where Susanna is a part of, and I'm just kind of there taking notes and um, being a backup for her. Um, Laura, I think you, you may want to say a few words about this um, S138. Yeah. So um, I was pulled in on this. I've been working with Jay Green also, who's a member of the Office of Racial Equity on uh, the act relating to school safety and kind of reviewing the different behavioral threat assessments um, and things like that. So I'll be Susanna's backup um, for that group. Yeah. Um, so we have that one. Laura is also working on a um, the network uh, health equity assessment. And then we have a few other ones that we're following. Um, Jay is a part of the H635. And probably some of you here are a part of some of these other working groups too. So you're probably familiar with that. Well, we're also following the pay parity discussion that's happening. Um, Susanna, I don't know if you wanna say anything about that. I think that's at the very beginning maybe. Yeah, that's um, currently an internal conversation that we're having with human oh, resources. Oh. No, no, it's fine. I mean, you know, internal, just like, I'm not gonna send you all a, a Zoom link for a public meeting about it yet. Okay. But um, it's a, <laughs> it, it, a bit of an inquest that we're doing with HR um, to look into a year over year comparison of pay uh, rates among state staff from different uh, demographic groups. This is something that was um, on our radar uh, a long time ago and other things kept um, getting in the way, but actually it's, it's, gosh, I was going to say, but actually that might help because we have more years, but actually we don't because there's, what we've discovered here is that so much data you would think is being collected, aggregated, and stored correctly is not. A huge amount of personnel information exists in paper files. And if there's one thing that the um, weather events of the last few weeks have taught us is that your paper is not safe anywhere. No. So, um so we're learning a lot about what does and what does not exist in terms of us being able to do uh, an inquiry into it. Um, but the reason that this is something that we are loosely concerned the DRJS in is because um, you all will recall that one of the things we really wanted to do through the division was to look at the upstream factors contributing to the data we're, we're being asked to steward. And um, 
pay parity, wage inequity, employment discrimination. These are all things that contribute to socioeconomic disparities that then fuel things like quote unquote crime rates. So um, to the extent that socioeconomic disparity may or may not be contributing to any of the data we're seeing here, like, you know, I don't know, um, wage inequity leading to insecure housing, leading to people doing things that sometimes people do when they have insecure housing, leading to jail, right? So, um, and I know that that line that I just drew is a lot more wavy and complicated than the way that I did it, but you know what I mean. So anyway, um, pay parity is something the office is doing more broadly, but that's the link that we see potentially with the DRJS's work. Great. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did not want to see Susanna has all that background knowledge. So I didn't I didn't want to say I wanted to let her say that. Thank you. Um, so this here we have this, you know what, this um, and I know we have a lot of text, you know, I think in the future we will probably try to, if we have to do these kind of presentations, um, boil it down a little bit. But we wanted to talk with you a little bit about the guiding strategies and principles. Many of these you're familiar with. Um but I think the main thing where we're focusing right now is developing the plans and policies, strategic plan, um, looking at different dashboards to get ideas about what we might want to do, um, data sharing agreements, policies for data governance. Um, yeah, so we can go ahead and start to establish those MOUs and kind of figure out what kind of data we need. Um, we also have um, resource development. Laura is heavily involved. Um, we're doing a national landscape analysis. We're trying to figure out where does Vermont fit in all of this. Um, so Laura is putting together a comprehensive database around population demographics by state. Um, and Laura, you know, I hate to keep calling on you, but I like for you to jump in with more details because I don't, I don't want to take away from what you. So um, right now I am gathering, unfortunately the census data is not as recent as I would love, um, but based on one of the resources from Pepper, the ACLU report a tale of two countries, all the data that they used in that report was from 2018. So this is at least from 2020. Um, so right now what I'm doing is pulling the census data together for all of the states as far as population and demographics, et cetera. And then also going to each of the um, Department of Corrections or Division of Corrections, depending on the state, um, and looking at their reports and their demographics for their populations um, using their data from 2022 as well so that we at least have the same kind of year comparison, but there's also projections that we can use from the census and also from uh, most of the correctional uh, departments that I've looked at so far. So that's what I've been working on there and we're hoping to kind of identify if um, the information is still the way that the ACLU report um, outlined where they they ordered the dis, this each state by um, the most disparity. So I'm hoping that we can kind of have a, a comparable look and updated look at that once this is kind of done. I just finished Arizona today, so. I also wanted to say, Laura, uh, because some, you know, some people might say, well, why are you going? Because I know Vera, a lot of places have done some of this national kind of this look. But the nuance that Laura is finding, kind of doing it this way, is very, very interesting. Um, and we had a brief conversation. I don't know if you want to mention the part about how different states are capturing different people. Yeah, so upon right. maybe the the problematic. <laughs> right. So some states. So the um, in the census, there's there's um, I think seven. I actually have the the spreadsheet pulled up right now. Um, yeah, seven different uh, racial groups that you can choose from. And then one of the options on the census is that you can choose between two, multiple races starting from two to six um, as well. But in some of the correctional, again, correctional organizations that I have been um, pulling data from, they don't have those same categories. So like, for example, um, Alabama in the census has all of that information. So for like the actual state population, but as far as their incarcerated population, they only have white, black, and other. Um, similarly. Um, in Arizona, like I said, I was, I was working on that one today. So, um, in their racial groups that they have for their population, they include Mexican Americans and also Mexican, Mexican nationalists. So, um, it's going to be really interesting to see how each of the, uh, DOCs 
kind of uh, categorize their populations uh, in that in that way um, as compared to what the federal government captures as far as racial demographics. So it's been really interesting to see the differences between each of the states so far. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing kind of what the similarities are or the differences are as we continue. So, yeah, we're going to keep you posted on that. Oh, hey, Tan, I think he has a question for you. Yeah. I, 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 I don't want to cut you off, but I, I just want to ask before I want the information before the meeting's over. Um, how is it going getting the interagency cooperation and MOUs? I asked this. Because when we were imagining this entity that you have embodied and given life, um, we we thought that that might be a challenge, I'll say. Um, and I guess I'm thinking ahead to the report that we have due at this point sometime at the beginning of the year. Um, if there is something that is not working for you all, I, you should feel free to bring it to this panel. We will, we will. I I'm, yeah, I, I think, I think we've had some very positive, a very positive. Okay. You all have laid some really good groundwork um, for us. Um, I think we will definitely be in your ear if things we need a little support in certain areas but so far so good i think summer it just being um summer months i think have um <laughs> maybe certain things haven't happened that would have happened already okay. um yeah we will keep you posted on next steps okay um, thank you yeah yeah we definitely will thank you um we won't be shy i think that right now it, it has felt smooth because we're still in the easy part um of setting up those mous when we start negotiating really nitty gritty terms then i think it's, it's probably going to be more challenging one of the things that we've discovered um through the very 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 helpful assistance of some of our colleagues in the agency of digital services is that the state does not really have a standardized uh way of doing data sharing MOUs. And they have pointed to examples from other states. Tiffany, you don't happen to remember what state that was that they were highlighting for us. Um, the Indiana or Indiana. Yeah. Um, and Indiana evidently legislated their data sharing uh, agreements, which I mean, wow. you know, it, it definitely shows a commitment to that act and that process. But I, I also wonder if putting it in statute could could also be too limiting. Um, so we'll probably want to know more about that. But the point is that, um, so, so through our exploration of this, what we are discovering is that there's, there is a bigger conversation around state government about data sharing agreements. And, and I think that the DRJS's work um, may end up helping to surface that and um, in, in sectors other than the one we're in. Okay. Great, thanks. Are you guys okay with other questions right now? Tiffany? Yes, absolutely. Okay, Judge Davenport. So I have a question about the court data, um, specifically the court data on juvenile delinquency. And what we know about that court data is that we're missing 20% of the, we're missing racial and ethnicity information in 20% of the cases. Um, in part, um, uh, that uh, that's there. There are multiple reasons for that, um, but I'm just wondering how, you know, when you're talking about and, and what you've presented is really, really exciting. It's something that I have wanted to see for a really long time. Um, but right now, um, one of the options in terms of racial data when there's a filing um, is that the data is unknown. And it another question is, based on, what's the racial data based on? Is it based on the officer observation or is this because this question was actually asked of uh, the youth? Um, 
So, and, and, and what I understand is that we kind of have a mix. It depends on whether the youth was taken to the police department. And if they were just cited, then it's officer observation. But if they were bought, brought to the police station, then it's, they're actually asked the question and they may quite understandably respond, I don't want to give you that data. So then, um, but in any event, there are at least 20% of the court cases, um, at least based on the information I have from the courts, uh, there are at least 20% of the delinquency cases where the racial data is unknown. And that's a lot. Um, if you're looking at disproportionate minority contact, that's a big deal because uh, the yeah. numbers, you know, your percentage um, could really change depending on what that 20% it is. So I'm just sort of wondering whether that's something you've talked about. I, I don't, it used to not be a problem in, in the adult data, but I, my understanding, and this is more hearsay than, than uh, actual um, knowledge, because I'm not in the judiciary, um, at now, but but that my understanding is that data is kind of getting worse. It used to be that 99% of the cases you had data, but uh, I'm not so sure that that percentage is um, as good now as it used to be. Um, and when I say 99%, it, there, there was an answer to the question as opposed to unknown. Um, mm -hmm. Unknown just is not very helpful. Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's anyway, I just wondered whether you've 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 kind of looked at that issue and um and and how you want to deal you think we should deal with that issue. Thank you, Judge Davenport. Um I, I, Susanna, I actually I think you have a lot of background. This is an ongoing issue across the board. And I'm hoping that we can inform the 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 conversation. Um you're bringing this to my attention simply because, you know, we haven't gotten into the data sets to know that yet. So that's a good flag for us um, as we're thinking about it. But we've had a few conversations about this issue. I know Susanna knows um, specifically about what's happening in Vermont. So I think if you want to weigh in on that, I, I would appreciate it. Yeah, that's one, um, Judge Davenport, I, it was nice running into you um, a little while ago. And I know we talked a little bit uh, about this exact topic. We're not in those weeds just yet as a division, but these are the anecdotes that we're hearing that are really important for us to keep collecting um, so that we can put pins in those and then come back to them. Uh, because when I hear that the data are missing for 20% of people, then what's even the point? Because our data set are not gonna be, it's not gonna be reflective of the population. And at that point, we start talking about the quality of the data. And then it, it makes us question why we're even having a collection procedure in the first place. I know that the last, I don't know, what seems like three or maybe four legislative sessions, it seems as if there's always a bill that updates what law enforcement agencies and others are required to give. And if not, then somehow agency of administration slash the office of racial equity will come and haunt you in your dreams or something like that. So we're seeing movement about using the, the figurative stick to um, you know, increase consistent compliance. But I think another really big piece about, and I know you're talking about the courts and now I'm, I'm sort of veering off into the law enforcement agencies, but I do think that- but it, it, the, the court data comes from the law enforcement agency. Right, it exactly. It, you know, that's where it comes from. Right, and so, I mean, a lot of this, you know, I'm also um, rounding out my my time as a vice chair on the um, Criminal Justice Council, and I know a few of you on this call are also parts of that. And, and there's, you know, there's a role that that council plays as well in terms of do we give a waiver to this law enforcement agency for not having submitted these data this year, then they won't be able to use the training facilities. They have a really small three person department and if they can't use the services then they're gonna, and it's like, how do we do right by struggling entities while also not being so lax as to nullify the value of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I may have phrased that bizarrely, but I, no. I hope it came across. It makes sense. 
that will be an ongoing discussion. And I think Susanna really um, laid it out very well. I think we have a lot of things planned. Um, so I think as we go through the slides too, I, I think it will make sense. And I, those are the kinds of things that we want to um, continue to, to think about um, and kind of ways that we can have those interactions with various agencies and, hey, how can we do this better? How can we have a more um, integrated system with data collection? Um, and, accurate, and, and, and accurate system. I mean, that's, that's the, you know, if, it's, if the data is not accurate because you can't collect it, you know, then, then the, the conclusions we draw from the data are, mm -hmm. are not right. So we have to have the data. The data has to be accurate. Correct. And, the, and that's no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, um, no. Go ahead, Aton. I know where the time is. Yeah, and that's what I'm just being mindful of. Rebecca's got a question. I don't know if anybody else does, and I don't know how many more slides you have. So I'm just trying to be efficient. Which do you want us to hold questions until the end? Just kind of run through really quickly. Rebecca, is that all right with you? That's fine. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Tiffany. Um, yeah, so, you know, so this is what we're doing. We're looking at other opportunities. We've already talked about developing data management. Um, I think a lot of what we're doing around gap analyses also with the sharing, that conversation will be had, um, you know, kind of what we're missing, what we need to do differently. Um, and yes, we're looking for new ways to support the work that we're doing, various grants and so forth. We're holding strategic meetings with various um, state and other agencies. Um, we're having a tour of the archives, so we make sure that we're incorporating um, records, doing the land, the um, legislative tracing, and so forth. We're incorporating that and having our resources at hand. Um, yeah, so a lot of data develop partnerships and development. Um, or we has a conference upcoming, and I, I think we will touch on that. I'm sure Susanna at some point. Um, We'll touch upon that in the next few weeks. Um, and this is something too that we are interested in doing is hosting a data equity boot camp for the division and interested state of Vermont employees. And that's where that conversation can be had as well. Like mm -hmm. um, how do we ensure that we're doing this in an equitable manner and that we are actually creating data sets that can inform policy and that we can have trust in. Um, so yeah, conferences, we're doing uh, various conferences, um, professional development opportunities. Um, we have, um, and developing a, uh, just kind of a personal library of resources, making sure we're touching all our points. Um, I wanted to point out that we do have a data equity presentation that we're doing um, with Jay, who yeah. works in our office. Um, I think that's going to be really powerful. Um, we've done a lot of work on that so far. Um, so that's upcoming. We also have the presentation at UVM that I talked that I talked about. Um, yeah, policing as a social determinant of health and addressing the public health crisis of systemic racism. Um, yeah, and various conferences just for us to get more knowledge about the landscape and resources that may be available to us. Um, yeah, so upcoming is the hiring of the two analysts, administrative assistant, that we're hoping can support the work. Um, hopefully a timeline, this is our draft, timeline of milestones. Um, so you can kind of see what we're looking at, but you know, we may be being a bit optimistic about the dashboard launch, but I think we still wanna be, um, we wanna have some goals in mind that help us to get to the next step. Yes. Okay. You have to go ask. I don't have blueberries. I'm sorry. Hold on one second. <laughs> okay. And then this is basically our final, one of our final slides. Um, Laura, if you want to just give a preview of what we're going to do for our presentation on the CCB board. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned um, to y'all earlier, I basically what I did um, in my first few weeks uh, working for the office is reviewing the resources sent by Pepper and identifying different um, questions for um, for the CCB for our office and um, I guess just more things to think about. Let me see if I can pull this up really quickly so I can um, speak more. Um, um, 
Yeah, so some of my questions were after um, doing this review, um, and I don't think I can share my screen, but it's really like not anything exciting. It's just literally three columns of questions that the different groups of people that I we have a lot of questions for, um, and then the next steps and stuff like that. Um, so some of our current data questions after reviewing the CCB materials is about uh, federal detainee data in our Vermont state data, if that's part of, you know, headcounts and different things across uh, different landscapes for criminal justice agencies. Um, also a lot of questions around municipal data uh, and what the CCB used and, and um, how they were able to kind of work with the different municipalities across the state. Um, something that you brought up earlier, Judge Davenport, was about the, the missing data set. So that was one of my questions too. Like, what are we going to do if, if there are missing data sets in the demographic information that we're trying to collect? Um, also identifying, um, like I mentioned earlier in this landscape that I've been building um, from across from everywhere um, about the multiple races, uh, if, we're, if we're going to be doing two, the two to six from the census and how the different um, DOCs are kind of capturing that information with their populations. Um, questions for the CCB um, are primarily around their social equity uh, licensure program. Um, and then for our office, um, a lot of questions about um, CGIS and, and that kind of data, um, if we need to be CGIS certified, as well as um, if there's uh, concerns for different kind of communities or different counties as far as collecting data and, and those kind of disparities there. Um, again, just a lot of identifying different areas of opportunity and analyze and analysis, <laughs> analyzing words um gaps uh if there are any um or where there are any um and then something that i've been working on for for you guys i believe um jay already sent this out at least to you Aton. um the historical some more on drugs resources i've been doing a lot of research on research on that and trying to build a little bit of a a reference uh library for for this group and also for our office so that we can you know keep in mind that these things are historical and have long roots in in all of our systems um but yeah so there's more work to do on this and tiffany and i will be working and talking more about the specifics of of connecting with the ccb and everything after with our questions but um that's kind of what we have or i have so far um for for the ccb assessment okay excellent thank you laura mm -hmm. yeah so you know you have our information um so you know, definitely we want to thank you, I think, for putting the division together, giving us time today. Um, and yeah, I think it's a great time to ask questions. If there's something we can't answer, we'll definitely get back to you about it. Thank you. Rebecca, you had one. And yeah. guys, we've got five minutes, so. <laughs> Thanks for this presentation. It's really fun to see this come to fruition. Question is this, can you share the status of the convening of the um, I'm gonna get the name wrong. The advisory council that is made up of a bunch of of members who is supposed to work with you and advise you and consult with you along with how you are sharing your work with the RDAP. Yes, the status is that um, we have recently gotten confirmation or new appointments from the appointing entities, and they are responding to a scheduling poll so that we can put them together in a room and watch them go. Sorry, is that Suzanne, is that you? Yes, that's me. Suzanne. Did you say, did you did you put a time frame to that? I just, if you know. I, <laughs> I did, and that time frame was a while ago. So when I nudge them again, uh, It'll it'll be a nudge. I can't take it personally because I'm the most chronic email non-responder in the state. But yes, we're we're working on an ASAP timeline here. Oh, I love you guys. I really do. Elizabeth, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it'll be I'll be really quick. Uh, I do just want to say, you know, if there's if there's any way that you know Tyler or I can help with the DCF MOU, please please reach out and let us know. Um, you know, my follow-up question was just, you know, 
there's issue Amy highlighted of there's unknown data, but there's also, I think we're going to run into issues of when you request an agency, they're going to just say, we, we don't collect that. We don't have any intention of starting to collect that. So I wonder what our role with RDAP is in supporting you as you uncover those. And I'll say, I'll say this coming from an agency that is just about to start beginning to gather data on reports that come in through our centralized intake services, right? Like we have never gathered the race of either mandated reporters who call in or the race of the youth and the families that they're reporting on before. We just have never done that before. Luckily, that is changing going forward, but, you know, I think we're going to come up across quite a few instances like that across different state agencies. Okay. Um, anyone else? Make it very brief. <laughs> Can no. you share, yes, very quickly, because I have so many questions and so much to learn. Can you share with us the dates and, um, well, any opportunities for training or conferences that we could go to? Because I certainly would like to participate and learn from you all. And you're all incredible and so much gratitude. Thank you. Certainly, we will be happy to do that. We have a few um, things that we're involved with. Um, happy to put that together and send it out. Yes. I'll send you our mailing list if that'll help, Tiffany. Yes, and we'll work it through Susanna because I know that she has a lot more sure. that she's involved with that may be right. useful for okay. this group. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not trying to be rude because I can't quite express my joy in having seen this thing as nothing and grow into an idea and grow into a report and grow into a greater idea and here are people doing work and it's just it's so exciting and it's one of those rare moments where i think wow state government can work and so thank you thank you very much um Clearly, the agenda went a little weird, um, but that's okay because the community safety subcommittee wasn't really going to prepare anything for tonight. Um, what I was going to ask of you folks from DCF was, what do you want to write in the report? <laughs> <laughs> um, we can have that discussion at another moment. Just put that in your head and let that soak and, you know, maybe write a little. Um the second look subcommittee, um, we're meeting on Thursday, I believe, at three. So there'll be more to report later. <laughs> um, so I think we can let that go for right now. And there's been concrete discussion about forming the upcoming report this entire time. So I'm not worried about that. Anything else anyone wants to put out for new business? Okay, moving on. Next meeting, I can't remember, September. I don't remember what day. Um, I'll let you all know, trust me, I will let you know. Um, anyone wanna make a motion? I love you, but does anyone wanna make a motion? Like, you know- This is Jessica, motion to adjourn. Thank you, anyone seconding that? I'll second that. Grand, there is no need for discussion. All in favor, signify in some form or fashion. Aye. Aye. All opposed. All abstaining. Thank you very much for your time, your participation, and certainly your passion and intelligence. And I will see you all in September. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.